lovely to be with you again uh, and to be able to share uh, from God's Word. Uh, as we do that, we're going to look at the book of Micah, uh, Micah chapter 6, uh, and we'll begin reading, um, we begin reading from verse 1. Micah chapter 6, and read from verse 1 says, Hear what the Lord says, Arise and plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. The Lord has this indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for the, my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And then we'll end there at verse 8 of Micah chapter 6. I wonder this morning if you've ever been uh, in a courtroom I wonder if you've ever received a court citation, that little letter that drops through your door and you think, oh no, it's got this jury citation on the front of it. Um, I wonder if you've ever had one of those uh, pop through your door, summoning you to attend, uh, a, a, to attend a court. Maybe as a juror, like that little letter that pops through your door, or maybe as somebody who's been accused, I never know, add that little, little line in, just, you never know who's in the, in the, in the congregation. I wonder if you've ever been in a courtroom, and it's an interesting place, and I want to try and describe a little bit what a courtroom looks like. You have the judge at the front, I'll point that way because I'm standing at the back and looking at the front. So at the front you've got the judge sitting behind this large bench, and down below you've got the clerk and all of that, taking notes, taking the minutes, taking what happens. Then on one side of the, the table that comes out from the, 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 the judge's bench, you have the crown and then you have the defence on the other side. The one's arguing for the, 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 the one that's accused, the defendant, and the other is arguing uh, against or arguing uh, whatever charge has been brought against this person. Uh, and as you move further down the courtroom, you get to this little box, probably about somewhere where I'm standing, and there is a, a little box where the defendant or the accused stands and then beyond that you have the public gallery where people can come and sit and listen on all the proceedings. This morning we've read in Micah chapter 6 and Micah chapter 6 is laid out something like a courtroom. Firstly Micah begins as if he is calling the Lord and the, the Lord's people Israel to a trial and this trial is to take place not just before, I forgot to mention the jury that's on this side, but not just before a fallible jury, a, a human jury, but it is to take place before the, the unshakable jury, the mountains and the hills, verse 1 and 2 of Micah chapter 6, 6 says this, Arise and plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. So what is it that the Lord is bringing against the people of Israel? Firstly, I always think it's helpful uh, to have a little background of what's happening at this point in history. Israel is divided into kingdoms, into two nations, the northern and the southern uh, kingdoms. The rulers of Israel were mostly bad kings. Um, there's a good kids program if you ever want to go through it. One uh, is uh, 40 hand signs that walk, walk through the Bible, 40 hand signs of the Old Testament. And that's what I, I kind of go back to, is divide the kingdom, mostly by kings, um, and so on and so forth. But anyway, so the rulers of Israel were mostly bad kings. And the same could be said in part, part for the kings of Judah. They were mostly bad kings, 
but few were good. Few loved the Lord and few pointed uh, the people of Israel to God. And you don't need to look, but in Micah chapter 1, if we were to flick back to there, we see that Micah is telling the people to listen what, to what he has to say. He is saying that judgment is coming. Verse 4 of chapter 1 says, The Lord is coming out of his place. Uh, and why is he leaving his place? He, verse 5 tells us, All this is for the transgressions of Jacob and for the sins of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So here we see that the Lord is coming in judgment, not just on one part or not just on a few people, but the Lord is coming in judgment against the whole people of Israel, all of God's people. He is bringing this indictment against the whole nation of Israel. But what relevance does that have to us today sitting in Bones in Scotland? What does this thing that happened so many years ago, what relevance does it have today? Much like Micah, and much like this message of Micah, the Lord has promised in Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. Firstly this morning, I want to remind you of what Micah has said in chapter 1, that the Lord is leaving his place. He is leaving, once again, he has promised that Jesus who died on the cross, who rose again, who ascended to heaven, is one day coming back to this earth. We don't know when, but he is coming. <coughs> and again, what difference does that have to make for us? We're told that when he comes, much like what uh, 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 Micah is saying, he is going to bring an indictment against us. There is a day coming that we will all be called before the Lord to give an account of our lives. So if firstly, Micah, if you like, is calling to a uh, calling court to order. He is reminding the people of Israel that the Lord is coming, that the Lord has something to say. Secondly, then, we have God, through Micah, uh, speaking to the people of Israel, as mentioned in verses 3 to 5 of Micah chapter 6. It says, O my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Here in, these first few, or here in these few verses, God sets forth how he has acted towards his people. He says, what have I done to you? Answer me. In verse 5, it, it mentions Balak and Balaam. Um, I don't know if you, you know the story of Balak and Balaam, but who, who are they or what significance do they have for us? Balak was the king of Moab, uh, and if you want to take the time later on uh, this afternoon, you can go back to Numbers chapter 22 uh, to 24, and you'll find Balak mentioned there. Balak had heard how the Lord was with the people of Israel, how the Lord was helping the people of Israel, and the people of Israel were camped in, in the plains of Moab, and Balak wanted to divide the people of Israel, yes, between each other, but also to, to divide the people of Israel from their God. And Balak, he called for Balaam uh, to come uh, and to curse uh, the people of Israel. But God stepped in and God overruled. As Balaam spoke, the words that God um, put into his mouth uh, turned them from a curse uh, into a, a blessing. And Balaam, instead of cursing the people of Israel, blessed them not just once, not just twice, but he blessed the people of Israel four times. So God here in these few verses that we uh, look at in verses 3 to 5 is showing how God cared for his people, how God protected his people, how God provided for his people. God reminded the people of how he brought them out of the land of Egypt and how he rescued them. Just like the story that we were, uh, the kids were being told this morning, uh, it fitted in quite nicely that you're talking about the people of Israel who were complaining and, and um, not not happy with where God had brought them to. But yet, here in Micah chapter 6, God has taken them back to that point and reminding them 
that how he rescued them, how he provided for them, uh, even though they had quails and manna every day, God still provided for them, st God still cared for them and looked after them. But the people of Israel sinned against God. They didn't trust in God's promise. And here we told, we're told at the end of verse 5, it says that uh, it mentions two places, Shittim and Gilgal. Shittim reminded the people of judgment as they disobeyed God. That was the first place that they set out to wander in the desert for 40 years. Um, and that reminded them of what happened there as they disobeyed God for those 40 years. And Gilgal then reminds the people of how God fulfilled his promise after those 40 years. So they set out from Shittim, they wandered in the desert for 40 years, and then Gilgal reminded the people of how God fulfilled his promise and brought them into the promised land. And this, in this passage, we have the Lord acting justly towards his people. He has acted rightly towards the people all of their lives. And yet the people continuously sin against God. If we were in a, 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 a trial or in a... a, a yeah, if we were in a, a courtroom and this evidence had been uh, put out, the evidence would be sacked up against the people of Israel. There's no denying that they were guilty of sinning against the Lord. And again this morning, what does that have to do with us? I said earlier on that the Lord is coming again. There's no doubt in uh, my mind, there's no doubt if you read through the Bible that the Lord has promised that he will come again. Even though we don't know when, he is coming. He is going to have an indictment against us. And much like Israel, God is going to show us what we are truly like. What we are truly like before him. The people sinned and they forsook God. And we have sinned and forsaken God. And we were talking to our, our young folks in our church last night. And we were saying that because of Adam, the whole team, the whole the rest of humanity is out. I don't know if you like, like baseball, I think it is. Or, I don't know, we played softball in our school. Um, and if, you, if the, the batter was to bat the ball and hit the ball, and the field of the team was to catch it before it hit the floor, the whole team was out. And it's the same uh, when it comes to the message of the Bible. Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God. And because of their disobedience, the whole rest of humanity is born into this world with sin in their lives. The Bible clearly states that no matter who you are, no matter what age you are, what you do, we all have sinned in the sight of God. So like Israel, there is strong evidence against us. The Lord is true and right. The Lord is trustworthy and true. But we, like Israel, are a sinful people. We only need to look back at how we've acted maybe this morning. We only need to think about the thoughts that we have had to know that we're not the people that God wants us to be. We're not perfect eh, in this world. So we've seen that God is holy and true. God is infinitely good, perfect, sinless, majestic. We've seen that the people of Israel are guilty of sinning, and so are we. And that brings me on to the third point I want to make this morning. What does the Lord require of us this morning? The people now see, uh, the people of Israel now see the state that they're in. They see that what the Lord is saying is true and right and that they are guilty. But here in this section, the next section of this, uh, this chapter in uh, verses 6 to 7, it says, What does the Lord require? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? The people were willing to pay a great price um, in order to buy uh, God's forgiveness. In these days, sacrifices were offering were offered as a way of atonement and payment for sin. And the people wouldn't would have given a calf that was young, a young calf without blemish, but they probably wouldn't have kept it until it was a year old because it would have cost them more. It would have they would have had to lay out more to to look after this calf and bring it up and feed it and all of that kind of stuff. It would have cost them considerably more if they were to offer a ram or a a, a sheep. They would have offered one lamb or a couple of lambs instead of um, thousands of rams, like it's mentioned in these few verses, and thousands of rivers of oil. These people were willing to give whatever it would took to be in a right standing with a holy God. They were willing to pay a great price 
um, to be in a right standing with God. And even going, they went a, a step further, and I think this crosses the line, but we're not in their, their days, we're in the 21st century. Anyway, thinking from a 21st century mind, you think this maybe goes a step too far. They went as far as offering their children as a sacrifice to order to, in order to buy their forgiveness. Isn't it so true that today that people will do whatever it takes to try and fill the void in their lives that is missing? The thing that is missing in their lives is a right relationship with God. They try to fill it with all kinds of things. They try to buy as many good things as they can get. They can spend all their money on folly. But yet there is still something missing in their lives. Maybe they think they can buy God's favour. Maybe they can uh, give their time, which is was good. Maybe they can give their money, but if it's in a if it's done in a way that is is wanting to buy God's favour, it'll never work. But verse eight of chapter of chapter six in Micah says this: He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Is Micah saying here that if you follow these three things, that you you'll be sorted. If you do justice, if you love kindness, if you walk humbly with your God, then you're sorted. The hymn writer and, and minister, a Reverend John Newton, says of verse 8, Take notice that there is hardly any one passage in the Bible more generally misunderstood. Therefore, I think it's helpful if we take a look back at Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5, if you flick back, uh, I'm going to take the time and read a little bit out of it. It says this, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, one whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labour has given birth, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flocks in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. When we look back at the Old Testament prophets, we need to interpret what is being said in the light of the New Testament writers. And here in Micah chapter 5, we have this prophecy or this promise that is given. And what is this promise? That one will come from the little town of Bethlehem, who will be a great leader. I know we're only into autumn. Don't worry, I'm not going to skip autumn and go to winter. I'm not going to do that. But I wonder if that, when you read that passage, does that spark something in your mind? Thinking of the one who came from the little town of Bethlehem. And yes, here, all these centuries before, Jesus is promised in the Old Testament. So verse 8 of chapter 6 has to be viewed in the light of of Jesus' coming. The verse 8 is not saying to work as hard as we can to be, um, be forgiven, but it is coming in full dependence of what God has done for us in sending Jesus. God has provided the sacrifice for us. God has taken the, the, paid the price for us if we come and accept God's free gift. Think with me again of, of this courtroom setting the defendant or accused is standing in this, this little box. All the evidence has been given. Uh, all the, the, the jury stands. They've gone off into the little room. They've discussed it for a little while. And they come back out and their spokesperson then is asked by the, the judge, well, who, what, what's the verdict on this, this person? The jury stands up and they say, there's no, no shadow of a doubt this person is 100% guilty as charged. The judge then gives the sentence, and the sentence is death. No other sentence is given, but the sentence is death. But this public gallery that I mentioned, there's somebody stands up, a man stands up and walks forward, and stands into this little box where this accused person is standing. And he looks at the judge and says, yes, this person is truly guilty. Yes, this person uh, is truly guilty, but I want to take their place. I want to stand in this box, and if you let that person go free, I will stand in their place. I will bear that punishment and the guilt that this one deserves, so that they can go free. 
And that's what we have here in this book of Micah. God is setting out all the evidence and the people are found guilty. They're willing to pay anything they can to escape, but the sentence remains. And as we look at this passage in Micah chapter 6, through the windows of the New Testament, God has set out all the evidence against us. We are guilty and we don't measure up to his glorious standard. And the punishment for us is eternal separation and eternal death. But one who is promised in Micah chapter 5, Jesus steps forward and says, I've paid the price, not in part, but in full. So you see, it's not just a case of doing justice and loving mercy in order to find forgiveness. It's a case of bowing at the feet of Jesus and accepting the forgiveness that he has so freely offered to us. You know, I don't know what you're like if you're reading the book, um, but I, I like reading through books. And sometimes I get a little bit excited about a book and I skip away to the very end chapter and see what, how the whole book resolves itself and see what finishes. And I'm going to do that with this book of Micah. I want to skip forward to Micah chapter 7 and verse 18. And it says this, Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? I want to say this morning, there's no one like our God. You know, names in the Bible uh, generally have a message or a meaning. Uh, they're thought about and they're given to, to different people or different places with a message or a meaning. And Micah's name means who is like God. There is no other God like the God of the Bible. There's no other religion like Christianity. Other religions say you need to work to earn your salvation, but Jesus offers it as a free gift. Uh, will you today, if you don't know Christ's forgiveness, accept what he has done and be allowed to go free? If we have accepted Christ's forgiveness, I hope we're reminded of all that it cost Jesus for us to be set free. We were once truly guilty, but Jesus stepped in and paid the price on our behalf. Finally, as I, I finish this morning, I want to just um, speak to us who are Christians. Again, from what um, John Newton has said, I, I tried to put this into my own words, um, but I thought there's no point. Uh, I, I just couldn't say it as succinctly and, and helpfully as what John Newton says. And he says this um, of, verse, or of the first part of that verse, to do justly. We are by nature attached to worldly goods and wholly influenced by selfish principles. But faith in Jesus communicates new motives, views and aims to the soul. It teaches us to have our treasure in heaven and to set loose to the world, to be satisfied with divine providence, with what divine providence has allotted us, and to love our neighbours as ourselves. Because they are our fellow sin sinners and are capable of being called to our petition, per sorry, participation with us in the honourable relationship and privilege of children of God. There is not a person upon earth who does not or can love or practice justice in its full extent until he has received the Spirit of Christ and lives upon him by faith for wisdom and strength from day to day. Secondly, to love mercy. None can truly love but those who have tasted it. When your hearts feel the comfort of God's pardoning love, you will delight to imitate him. When you can truly rejoice that he has freely forgiven you that immense debt. This sense of God's goodness and the continued need you find of his renewed mercy from day to day will soften your, soften your spirit, disarm you and gradually waken every proud thought. You will be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You will put on bowels of meekness, long-suffering and compassion, forbearing and forgiving, because God, for Christ's sake, has freely forgiven you. Mercy will be your delight. And thirdly, to walk humbly. In Christ is your peace, you will delight in God. You will set him before you, commune with him, study to please him and to keep his commandments. This is to walk with God, and you will walk humbly. Remembering how much you owe to free grace, how far you fall short in your best endeavours. These considerations, impressed by the Holy Spirit, will humble you, will keep you from being high in your own esteem, 
why is in your own conceit and from seeking great things for yourself. You will be habitually thankful when the Lord gives, content when he withholds, patient when he afflicts. You will confess yourself unworthy of the smallest mercies you possess and acknowledge in your heaviest trials that he has laid far less upon you than your iniquities deserve. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. These are the three things that if we know Christ this morning, we should endeavour to do, is to love the Lord our God above everything else, uh, and to love to, to show and to, to live out our lives before other people, that they may see the God that we serve. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning uh, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for the book of Micah. We thank you for the, the prophecy or the, the promise that is, is it contained in that. We thank you for chapter 5. The promise is the one that will come from Bethlehem. Father, as we look back on the Old Testament through the windows of the New Testament, we thank you, Lord, that we can rejoice that Jesus has come. We can rejoice that Jesus died on the cross, that he laid down his life, but also, Lord, that he took it up again, that he rose again. Father, we thank you that he offers us free life, uh, free uh, forgiveness for our sins. And Father, we thank you that um, we um, have the privilege of being able to partake in that. We pray, Lord, for those who do know you this morning. Help us, Lord, to, to live our lives out before others. Help us, Lord, to, be, to do justice. Help us to love mercy. And Father, all the days of our lives, help us to walk humbly with you. Father, we just pray, Lord, that in, in, in our, our daily lives that, that people might see and wonder at, at why we do what we do or how we do what we do, and it's all because of you in us. Father, help us to live our lives out before other people and point them to you. Father, as Moses, uh, like we were reminded earlier on, as Moses lifted up the snake and all people were to look to the snake if they wanted to be forgiven, we pray, Lord, for us in our lives that, Lord, we would lift Jesus high and point other people to him that they might know forgiveness for their sins and freedom in a new life. So, Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Pray, Lord, that you would continue with us now as we remember what Jesus has done for us. We pray this all in your name. Amen.